Megan? Jim? I don't know about some of you. I'm wondering this one. I'm praying for you. I believe that God is going to do even more in our service today. Hey, if we didn't get to meet, uh, my name is Kyle. I'm the lead pastor here. We've been praying for you uh, all this week. If you'd have a life changing experience uh, with Jesus today, hey, I'm going gotta, I gotta to brag on, on my kid for a moment. Uh, uh, just it's a proud dad moment. I posted on, on Facebook a couple weeks ago, but um, you, know, you know, many of you saw that. But uh, my daughter Ansley, she's six. She started riding her bike without training wheels. Yeah, it's a big deal, right? It's a big milestone. Uh, and, uh, and so we've been kind of working on it for a couple months now. We took one training wheel off uh, to kind of help her kind of feel out that how that feels. And she didn't like that very much. Uh, she, she she liked the crutch, you know, uh, uh, of both wheels, but. Uh, but finally, we worked up the courage to say, hey, let's, are you ready? We're, we're ready to take both of them off. And, and finally, all right, let, let's do it. So it took, it took a couple weeks of her trying to do that. And, and she kept trying to get her balance, as many of us, if you remember that, kept trying to get a balance. And she kept, you know, falling and having a hard time getting more. She got frustrated quickly. And she would, she would get back. And she would stop. And all right, all right, all right, just chill, you know. Uh, well, with Amy, my son, it was a little different. We kind of had to just let him just roll with it. We kind of had to just step out of the way and just say, all right, all right, but, you know, because uh, you know, the more you kind of force it with him, especially at CJ, you know this from Wednesday night, uh, boys ministry, uh, you know, he, he kind of just gets frustrated. So I'm like, whatever. Uh, and, in fact, when all the quarantine stuff kind of started happening uh, last year, many of us guys were over at Bill Bauer's house, and we were having coffee because, you know, we, we weren't able to go and meet at the coffee shop downtown, and, and I remember uh, I took Aiden with us because school wasn't in at that time, and, and I took Aiden with it, and he was playing with, with his grandkids, Gabby and Hunter, and, and all of a sudden, they had got their bikes out, and so I see my kid, he's zipping around the tree on, some, uh, on another bike, on the tree was, I'm like, what happened? Like, nobody was there, you know, to push him, you know, to have those dad moments, you're like, all right, son, you got it, you know, he just, he just learned it on his own. Different and so, uh, but but we tried to kind of, all right, maybe we need to give her her space and just kind of see what happens. And, and we were working in the yard. I think it was last Saturday uh, morning. We were working in the yard, and she was kind of working on it. She kept getting frustrated. She kept falling. But, but there was one moment where where she got on and she she got the pedal set in the right place, and, and she started to go a little bit. But then, then she quickly fell. And, and I was just looking back and I was like, hey, wait a minute. I said, do that again. Then get on there, start pedaling. All right, now pedal, 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 pedal. You gotta keep pedaling because I noticed if she would keep pedaling, the balance would come. And I feel like many of us we we quit too soon because we're so worried about not falling, right? And we quit things way too soon when we just need to keep going, right? And we need to understand that our daddy, our heavenly father, is right there alongside with us. He's not gonna he's not gonna let us fall necessarily. Sometimes he will let us fall, but he's always there to pick us back up. And be there right alongside us every time, hey, you've got this. Keep going. Keep pedaling, right? How do we keep going in life when we're not feeling it? How do we keep going when, when, when it's situations in our life, when circumstances that we come across, when, when there's moments that we go through and it's like, it, it feels like there's a lot of weight on us or there's heaviness or, or, or it's a, a doctor's report that we didn't expect or maybe it's just a bad day. You know, we have those sometimes or it's a flat tire or it's just... All kind of different things or the craziness that we're living in in our world today. And it's like, you know what, I was just not feeling it. How, how do we have the strength to stand in those moments? Will you have the faith to stand and stand strong and keep going no matter what we face? Because we're going to face things. It's part of life, right? We're going to face it. How do we have the strength to stand? Will you have the strength to stand to be able to do that? So we started a series a couple weeks ago called Not Feeling It. Because let's all be honest, there's some moments in our life. Where it feels that way, and we're just not feeling it. So we looked at Elijah. Elijah had a really dark moment in his life, and, and we learned that God gives us exactly what we need when we need it. God, God is an on-time God. He will show up exactly when we need it with what we need. Paul, we looked at last week, we looked at Paul. And Paul's writing a letter to the church from prison, and he's writing encouraging words from a crazy situation to this church to build them up. And he says, listen, I've found the secret to being content no matter what I go through in this life, Right? So we learned that we will always struggle with discontentment until we look to Jesus as our source. And today we're going to look at Daniel, a, a very familiar character. Many of us know the story of Daniel and the lion's den, especially if you have kids and you grew up with veggie tales, right? You know, I am King Darius, that is my name, right? And, and, and so we know, we know this story is familiar, right? So if you have the Bible, turn to Daniel chapter 6. 
We're going to start in verse 1. So as you're turning there, uh, just in case maybe you don't know that story uh, very well, I just want to give you some kind of context and, and just kind of set the scene for you a little bit. Uh, Daniel had, had served uh, three different rulers at this point in time. This is the third one we're about to look at. He's about 80 years old at this point. He was, he was very faithful, uh, Daniel was, and God gave him this great favor with these uh, with these kings, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar, and, and now we're about to learn about King Darius, and, and they're in this Babylonian captivity, and here's this Hebrew boy that got brought into all this, that God has elevated even in the enemy's camp, right, because that's, that's the favor of God, that's what God will do, right, and, and even in, in the enemy's camp, God has elevated uh, King Daniel into, like, the inner circle uh, of the king. For many years, he served in this role. He had this gift that God had given him of interpreting dreams, and that's kind of where we see, uh, you know, his, his kind of door in this, his opportunity to come in. Uh, he had that gift. He was very wise, and, and just godly wisdom allowed him to be able to have favor uh, within all these different rulers. And so, here we find him uh, with King Darius now, the, the third uh, ruler that he served under. And, and King Darius kind of has this really great strategy, you know, strategic mind, and he kind of begins to structure things differently in the kingdom. And, and he sets up to where there's 120 uh, satraps. Uh, these are like overseers, they're the kingdom protectors. And then there's three administrators that are over all of those people, okay? And Daniel is one of those administrators. This is all to prevent rebellion, it's to oversee taxes and national financial matters, and really just protect the king. And so if we'll pick up here in Daniel chapter 6, starting in verse 1, and we'll read up to verse 3, we'll, we'll read some more here in a little bit, but, but we'll pause there. Uh, it says, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were uh, made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom, right? Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. And God, I thank you so much uh, for your word that, God, this is something that we can stand on. Lord, there's times when, when we struggle, God, there's times when we go through things, but God, your word, your truth, God, is a rock that we can stand on. And, and, and I remember the story uh, where, where I believe it was Jesus said that, 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 that if we build our house upon this rock, uh, we will stand not like the man who, who built his house on, on shifting sand, Lord, but, but on your truth, on your standard, on your ways, Lord. God, this is how we can stand. We trust in you. We trust in your word. So God, help us to get this today. Help us to, to get some revelation from you, from the life of Daniel. God, so that we can stand strong no matter what we face in this life, in this world. In Jesus' name, everyone say amen. 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 So, so here we go. You know, again, Daniel has found favor. Even in the enemy's camp, amongst not just uh, you know different people and rulers, but, but against it, you know with this king, he, he's been uh, elevated in, in his uh, you know his influence and being able to do this all his life, really, all throughout you know this story, we see Daniel standing out, and that's what happens if we truly serve God and we're we're truly living for Him, if we're truly standing for His truth, we will stand out. In fact, that's what we are called to do. We're called to be in the world, but not of it. We, we should be separate and we should stand out. We should stand out in how we live this life amidst everybody else. The way that we talk, the way that we act, how we react to things in this life and in this world, it should be different. And that's what God is calling us to be. We should be Daniels. In our different spheres of influence, on your job, in your schools, in, in, in your college, in, in, in your home, in your neighborhood, in your communities, on the ball field. Come on, parents. Yeah. Come on, parents. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We're called to stand up and stand out. And that's where Daniel found himself here once again. But of course, you know, there's always going to be somebody that don't like it, right? And so the other two administrators alongside of Daniel became jealous because here he is. He's been elevated. He's not really one of them necessarily because of his upbringing, his background, where he's from. This Hebrew boy is now elevated uh, amongst everybody. And they, they, become, they become jealous, right? And as we begin to read through this story, we see where they plot against him. 
They come, they come against Daniel. They try to try to catch him. They try to trap him so that so that they can get him out of the way. And we see Dan, we see him stand strong with a supernatural strength over and over and over again. We see the faithfulness of Daniel to his God. He doesn't waver. He doesn't cower. He doesn't say, "Oh well, we got captured, so we might as well just go along with the flow." No, he continues to be faithful to God even in the midst of a crazy situation. Over and over again, he stands strong. We see him uh, develop, and we'll see it even more so in this, uh, in this passage as we read on. He develops this lifestyle of serving God that way of prayer and, 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 and just giving his life to God and making daily decisions to serve God and live for him no matter what. Come on, you may know some people like that. You may know some people that have just this crazy, audacious faith. It's like they, they, it's like they, they, they can't be shaken. They, they believe, like they, 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 they talk and talk, they walk and walk, and they believe God will show up, right? You, you know some people that are like that. Come on, we may know some people, we know we can go to them, and they will pray, and they will pray fire down over your life, and you'll see God move. We know some people that God moves in, in, in their prayers, and, and when they pray, people are healed. Like we, we know people like that. In fact, we are meant to be those people as well. That's not just for select people. That's for all of us to walk in, right? You may know some people who have complete peace even in the midst of chaos. We may know some of those people. But guess what? That didn't just happen in their life overnight. The, the way that Daniel was and the way he conducted himself and lived his life, that just didn't happen and develop overnight. That was who he was. That was ingrained and instilled in his life. And that's something that he held on to. This stuff doesn't just happen. It came from a lifestyle of prayer. It came from a lifestyle of faith. It came from a lifestyle of saying, Hey God, I'm going to serve you no matter what. And not wavering and not caving and not cowering. It was built into his life. It was a lifestyle. Just happen overnight. So, so what I want to do is I want to help some of you. I want to help all of us be like Daniel, no matter what comes our way, to where we can stand. Anybody want to stand strong? Come on, in the days we are living in, anybody need to stand strong? Come on. So I want to help you with that. Three truths to help you stand strong, even when you are not feeling it. Because you can. You can stand strong. You can stand. Even though the world may be falling down around you, we can Stand strong, but it's not by our might, it's not by our power, but only by the Spirit of the living God. Come on, somebody. Right? We can, though. We can't. Even when we don't feel like it, we can. Even when something seems impossible, we can stand. Even when the odds are stacked against us, we can stand. And it's not going to be your strength. It's not going to be your good things. It's not going to be your abilities. It's not going to be your good looks. It's not going to be your status. It's not going to be how much money you make. It's not going to be any of those things that we put so much on. It's all going to be from our ability to trust God. So here's three truths, right? Because your ability to stand is determined by your willingness to trust God no matter what. And, and the reality is, before we even get into anything else, is that life can be tough, right? Anybody know that? Life can be tough. People can be cruel. Anybody know that? And then the enemy, the devil, he don't like you. Right? So, so there's going to be things that we face and we've got to learn how to stand strong no matter what. Here's three truths when you're not feeling it. Ready? Number one, when God raises you up, expect opposition. It, it, it's going it's to come in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's people, a person, a situation, the enemy, like, it, it's going, we're going to face opposition, right? We're not promised that everything's just going to be perfect, but we are promised that we can have strength to stand and get through. You might come uh, to a place in your life that everything's good and, and you're excited about your faith, God, and you're, you're growing in your relationship with God, and, 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 and there's all kinds of maybe good things. Maybe you're experiencing some blessings in your life, maybe you got a promotion, or, or maybe things are going well, you did good on the test, right? And, and, and whatever it may be, maybe things are going good, but then all of a sudden something tries to tear you down. Maybe it's a situation, a doctor's report, something you see on the news, right? The news is going to tear you down, so don't be so caught up in the news, right? There's bad news out there. Let's just throw that out there. You don't have to watch the news to know that, right? But maybe, maybe it's a person that, that might tear you down. You might have people. It might even be some close people that end up tearing you down, family, friends. It, it might even be some church folks sometimes. Shouldn't be that way, Right? 
And there may be some things that God has called you to stand up for. Maybe you as a family have decided, hey, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to homeschool our kids because that's what we feel is best for our kids. And that's your right, and you absolutely should do what is best for your kids. Maybe it's to take them out, out, of, out of a particular school and put them somewhere else. Like, you do what's best for your family. But there's always going to be somebody that's going to run their mouth, right? You, you might have decided that, hey, I'm not, you know, we feel God has called us to downsize, so we're going to you know, sell some stuff, we're going to get a smaller place so that we can be a blessing to other people, so that there's more margin for us to be a blessing for others, right? And God may have called you that, but there's always going to be somebody that's going to, you know, have something to say about it. You might speak out against injustice. You might post something on Facebook, and then you got all the trolls that want to clap back at you. You might stand up for godly things and say, no, this is what the Bible says, and this is the truth, and this is what we should live by. And let me tell you, honey, there's going to be a lot of people have something to say about that. And there may be different things that God has called you to stand for, but there's always going to be opposition. And we might as well get that in our head and our heart and understand that and not get so torn down and not get so beat up over it. It's going to come. But how are you? This is the question. This is where we need to live. How are we going to stand when we face that opposition? Because it's coming. We're not, we can't avoid it. We can't sweep it under the rug. We can't run from it. How do we stand? How do we stand? How do we stand in it? How do we stand out in it? What can God do? In us and through us in those moments. God may, may try to raise you up and, and others may tear you down. Even, you know, even in our world, you know, people may say, hey, listen, you, you know, you're just being too religious. You're, you're just being one of those holy rollers. Well, yeah. there's always going to be somebody that tries to do something. There's an actual thing, it's called a crab syndrome. You can Google it, look it up, right? But if you put crabs in a bucket, one may try to climb out, but the other crowds will tear it down. Hey, if, 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 if we can't be free, nobody can be free, right? And it's an actual thing. Trust me. <laughs> but there's going to be opposition in your life. It might be a person. It might be difficulties. It might be your finances, your family, your health, your job. It could be so many different things. It might be a spiritual attack. Either way, some opposition at times in our life are going to try to bring us down. How do we stand in those moments. Daniel has continued favor. We, we see that throughout his story. And here we have these politicians that now want to try to bring Daniel down. So let's try to find some dirt on him. Like, we don't know about that, do we? Right? Uh, well, let's try to run an ad campaign against Daniel. And let's, let's try to slander his name. Like, we, we've never seen that before. Right? Nothing's new under the sun, is it? So, so they try to come up against Daniel, they try to catch him, they try to do something to go against him, and, and they realize Daniel's he's got nothing. We can't find anything, we can't dig up any dirt, this guy's squeaky clean. What are we what are we gonna do? So they come up with a scheme because they know if they if they go against his faith, either he's gonna go against his God or he's gonna go against the king. And if he goes against the king, boom. God. So they come up with this plan. And this scheme, come on, start, start back if you've got your Bible still open. Daniel 6, verse 4, let's keep reading. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Here's a false idea. Serving God means that nothing will ever go wrong in our life. That is a big lie, and it's just not true. Right? We're going to face opposition, because here's the deal. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle with principalities and powers, right? There's a very real enemy of our soul who does not like you and wants to take you out. And here's just a side truth for you. If you're not ready to face opposition for being obedient to God, you're not ready to be used by God. <clears throat> it's just the reality of it. You're going to face opposition, even sometimes when we have to go against the grain. As long as we're obedient to God, we might uh, offend people. We, we might, we might uh, you know, come against people, but I'm not going to come against God. I'm not going to offend God. 
So these other two administrators, they, they butter up the king, and they're like, oh, your eyes are number one. King Darius, your muscles are number one. King Darius, you are number one. You, your robe is made from the finest linen in the land. You're rocking the Jordan sandals. You, you King Darius, you are the goat, like the greatest of all time. You know, and they try to butter up the king, and, they, and they're really, and then they come in like, listen, King Darius, come on. If, if we just set this decree, if people, if we say that nobody can pray to any other god but you, because you are, are worthy, and we are not worthy, you know. But, 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 if, but if we set this decree to where nobody's able to pray to anyone other than you, then for 30 days, if, if they do that, we throw them in the lion's den. Right? And King Darius agrees because it feels good to be told all those nice things, right? But he agrees. And so they set this degree. So, so what's Daniel going to do now? What, what, what's Daniel going to do? Say, well, you know, hey, I don't, I don't want to do this. You know, I'm 80 years old now. I've lived a good life, right? I, I, I've, I've seen some really cool things. I've been, around, I've been around for a minute. I've done a lot of great things. So, so maybe I just need to lay low, right? I, I, I'm better. I'm better alive than I am dead, right? To be able to keep speaking into the king's life and, and all these people. And we can do that. We can try to justify things and twist things the way that we want them, right? Daniel could have easily done that. Think about, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to pray quietly. Right? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go where nobody's gonna see. I'm just gonna pray on my own, right? In my head, you know. And, and, and if they ask me, hey, are you praying? I'm just like, no, I'm just taking a little power now. <laughs> and no lie, I had a friend of mine when we were teenagers in youth group. Now, youth teenagers, don't don't do this, because I'm gonna call you out on it. But but he we would sit in the back, like some of you in the church do every week. Um, and, and it was sitting in the back. And, and he would lean, and, and Ted generally know, but I'm not going to call his name out because I don't want to call him out like that. But, but he would lean his head on the pew like this, and, and he would tell people he was praying, but he wasn't praying. He, he was sleeping every week. He would tell people he was praying. And I'm telling teenagers, adults don't do that either. I'll call you out. You better wake up. What's Daniel going to do? Is he going to stop praying? Is he going to give in? When they start mandating things, talk quietly. Is he going to pray silently and just kind of keep him under wraps? Or, or is he going to keep praying and risk death? How did he have such audacious faith to stand strong? Verse 10. Daniel 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows open toward Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees, and he did what, church? He prayed. He didn't cower. He didn't cave. He didn't get scared. He didn't ask God, God, would you remove this? Would you just come down and smoke these people and strike them down with your uh, mighty right hand? He went. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, and I love this line, just as he had done before. How do we stand? How do we have faith? How do we stand strong when we're not feeling it? Kneeling to pray is what gives you the strength to stand. He did what he had always done before. It did not shake him. It did not move him. It did not faze him. He's like, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep moving. I'm going to keep praying. This is nothing to my God. And he did what he had always done before. Our first response to problems should never be panic, but it's our human nature, right? But it should always be a prayer. But how many times, how many times do we, we go through things and, and, and we, we face up against a wall or issue or struggle or situation or whatever it might be, and, 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 and we say, well, we gotta do something. And we start taking matters into our own hands, we start acting quickly. Right? And then when all those things don't work, oh, well, I guess all we can do is what? All we can do is pray. That should be our first response. Yeah, we, we can pray. We get to pray. Come on, the God of the universe hears your prayers. He doesn't just hear our prayers. He answers our prayers. God of all creation wants a relationship with you, wants you to trust in him, give your life to him. And he hears us when we call his name. 
Bible tells us that those who call upon the name of the Lord are saved. He hears us when we call. And He's faithful to answer. All we can do now is pray. No, we can pray through the whole thing from start to finish. How have you cultivated a lifestyle of prayer? Or does your life, do we end up trying to work it in to wherever we can in our life and in our schedule? I'm not talking about your blessing over your food. I'm not talking about just, oh, well, I, I thought about God today. I'm talking about actually have you carved out time in your day and in your schedule and in your business. Oh, Pastor, I'm just too busy in this. And that's the biggest lie that we Christians believe in. We are not too busy. The thing is, we value and, and we do what we want to do the most, right? There is time in our day to pray. We have to spend our time. If, if you call yourself a Christ follower, if you, if you like to come in and you like to shout unto God every Sunday, but, but we don't spend time with Him the rest of the week, we're missing the whole thing. There is time in our day. We have the same amount of time every day. It's been that way since the beginning of time. We have 24 hours in our day. A good chunk of that we spend sleeping. But we fill it with what we want to fill it with. Amen. And we do what we want to really do. Is prayer in that? And then we prioritize everything else around that. Daniel's years of relationship and dedication to God, it was, it was built on this. This is what his lifestyle was. This was his routine. He, no matter what, he's praying three times a day. That, that, that was his go-to thing. That's what, and I'm guessing that wasn't over meals, you know. Meat's good, meat's tough. Lord, I hope we have enough. And hey, I pray today. times a day he was seeking after God and the rest of his day was worked around that. What's your go-to? Is this prayer your go-to? This was not Daniel's last resort. It was his go-to. And notice he doesn't announce it to everybody watch. I'm just going to pray anyway. Go on Instagram have your Bible out with a nice cup of coffee situated just right with your favorite uh, place that you go to on the front, you know, the logo the Bible and it's all perfectly neatly put out there and, and take a shot of it. I'm praying today. Hashtag, so blessed, so spiritual, whatever. <laughs> Nobody cares. You should be praying. Get off my soapbox. <laughs> you should post, hey, God answered my prayer today. How about that? That would be more beneficial anyways. But he doesn't announce it. He just does it. It was ingrained in him. That was what he went to. That was his reaction. Oh, something's going on? Pray it. Nothing's going on? Pray it. Daniel was persistent in prayer. It was a habit. It was a lifestyle, and he worked his schedule around it. What's incredible is that he doesn't allow his crisis to move him to prayer, right? But the crisis did not break his routine of prayer. It did not break him. It did not move him to do that. He just continued doing what he always did. He knew where his help came from. He knew who his source was. And he just continued to do what he had done before. He didn't hide himself away in an inner room somewhere. He didn't hope that, that uh, you know, he would remain undiscovered. He opened up the window so everybody could hear. He didn't immediately cry out, God, deliver me from this unjust edict. This is wrong. This is unconstitutional. This is... Uh, he just did what he had always done and prayed, prayed some more. He actually begins by giving thanks to God just like normal. It's what he had done before. He pre-decided every day, I'm going to seek God no matter what. If your relationship with God is it's loosey goosey and it's just it's just whatever and, and, and it's just I, whatever I get around to that I'll pray. I don't even I don't know if you really have a relationship with God. I know that might be a hard thing. You might feel like, dang, bro, why'd you do that to me? But that's, that's, that's the thing about it. This is our time spent seeking God. How do you have a relationship with someone you don't talk to? Do you go through your week without talking to your spouse? Don't answer that. <laughs> Call me. We'll set up some, some counseling. But, but that's how you have a relationship. 
Did you spend time with them? How can we say we have a relationship with God? How come there's so many people that would consider themselves a Christian, but they don't really spend time with God? Daniel pre-decided that I'm going to pray three times a day. No matter what happens, I'm trusting him. We, we, we've got to take this seriously, church, because you better believe the enemy's got a strategy up against you. We've got to take this. If, if you haven't seen the, the world and where it's been headed for years now, this isn't anything new. It's interesting. We get all up in an uproar about the things going on in our country and in the world. But this, is, this has been leading for years now. And all of a sudden now, what are we going to do? We need to do what we should have always been doing. And that's praying and seeking the face of God. And whatever it is that he speaks in those moments and he speaks in this life, that's what we do. We're obedient to him no matter what. We trust in him no matter what. But we better take this stuff seriously. If that means you need to rework your schedule, if that means you need to get up early, because you know you got kids, and as soon as your kids are awake, that's it, in game. That's what you're focused on. Like, whatever you got to do, to get a hold of God, to spend time with Him, remove whatever is limiting your proximity to God. In other words, remove whatever it is that's going to keep you from getting close to Him. That might be people, that might be situations, that might be the TV, the remote, your phone, that might be a number of different things, but you need to remove whatever it is. It might be sin, you need to remove and get it out of your life so that you can get close to God. Haley and I went to a conference years ago in Alabama. Evangelist Pat Schatzlein was speaking there, and Haley had gone through a leadership program with him. And so, I mean, let's, let's go up there. And even though I don't, I don't want to hear Roll Tide all weekend, but, but we, we went anyway. Because it was right down the road from the college. Pat's brother was the pastor at this church now. Previously, it was his father. They called him Bishop. And his father was actually there. Had retired from ministry, but it was still very revered, and he actually spoke in one of the breakout sessions, and it just, it blew my mind, and he, I don't know if you even remember this, when he spoke, he told us about his kind of schedule when he was pastoring, and he said every day, 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm up praying. 4 o'clock in the morning, y'all, bro, I'm, I don't even know what life is at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it's dark, that's what it is, because that's my eyelids. Every day, 4 o'clock in the morning. And, and not just like a little devotional on the phone, because it's my daily reading plan, blah, blah, blah. It was hours of seeking under God. There, there were other times he would say, I'd be at my office, and I'd, I'd schedule in prayer to my everyday thing. And I would tell my secretary, listen, I don't want to be, don't bother me in this time. And I thought, I was like, really strong. But, but the point of it was, he valued prayer, and he saw God move in incredible ways throughout his ministry. And that church is still thriving to this day. Are we, are we removing what's limiting us from getting a hold of God? If you don't have a daily prayer time, what's it going to take to develop one? Because I know you've heard this. This is nothing new. We know we need to pray. What's it going to take to do it? How, are we going to develop that time in, in our life? I think of, of these cards nowadays. I'm so thankful for this. That, that will tell you how much you have left till your car is going to be out of gas. Eddie, I'm thankful for it. Because I like to live life on the edge this way. And my previous car did not have that. And Haley can tell you, I've been run out of gas so many times. I had to call her, hey, bring me a can and I'm, I'm out. How do you do that? But I'm thankful. But hey, since you don't laugh, because I still live on the edge. I'll let it get to eight miles until you know, it's empty. I'll let it get to five. I'll let it get to two one time. I know my limits. Just me. <laughs> but there have been times when I have literally been riding on fumes. Listen, Christian, listen, church. If we're living a prayerless life, we are riding on fumes. We are literally trying to get through our day every day, riding on fumes. Guess what? When those difficult moments come, we're not going to be able to stand. Because we're running on Eve. This is important. We have got to get this. Fine. I know what it's going to take till we finally get this. 
Let me give you a little bit of, of just a practical application real quick. And this is just some beginner stuff. So maybe, maybe you're in the room, maybe you're fairly new to the faith and, and you're trying to get started, but you keep, you know, just keep going. Don't, don't just stop. Don't be like Ansley and wobble and, and don't, you know, keep pedaling, keep going, right? But first and foremost, pick, pick a time or times. You know, be like David, say, hey, these are many times a day, I'm going to do it. And work it into your day. Pick that. You can set a reminder on your phone. We have no excuses anymore. We never really did, let's be honest. So, so set those reminders. Do it. Put it in your calendar. Do whatever you got to do. Say, hey, this is the time I'm going to do it. And stick to it. If you miss it here and there, don't, don't get so caught up on that. Don't let it knock you out. Just keep going. So pick your times. Remove any distractions. It might be your phone, but you're like, hold on, Pastor, my devotion's on. But, but your phone distracts you. you might, that might not be the best thing to have with you. You may need to pick something else. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a devotional. It can just be quiet time. You praying to God can look a lot of different. You can just have your Bible out. Some, I'll be honest, I like music, but sometimes music distracts me because I'm a musician. And I'm playing air drums along, and I'm trying to pray, and I'm, and I'm hearing words, and I want to sing, and, and there's sometimes I get distracted that way. But honestly, the older I've gotten in, 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 in my walk with the Lord, the more I just want to be still and be quiet before Him and allow Him to speak. Don't make it complicated. Talk to God like you would anybody else. Well, some of you maybe not. You, maybe you need to talk to different, but you, you know what I'm Learn to listen and be still. So many times we spend time praying and we just talk and we just tell God, and that's good. We should do that. Sometimes just learn to sit, be still, and listen for His voice. We as a society cannot sit still anymore. We don't know what that is. We don't know how to do that. I went to pick up Chinese food the other night for Haley and I, because that's kind of like our default thing. Oh, we don't want to cook our right, Chinese food. And so we go, and, and I'm in there, and there's maybe five or six other people waiting for their order, and everybody's on their phone. We don't know how to just stop and not, like, I don't know what to do with my hands. Like, it's got to have something, i got to have something in front of me. My, our kids are getting that. My kids, we're just sitting watching a movie on the couch, and they're flipping upside down and doing all that. And they're just kids. But we don't know. Some of that's us. We don't know what, what, what I do. Like, there's nothing going on. Like, we don't know how to sit and be still. And I think that's a huge struggle and hindrance for us when we do pray. Because we don't know how to sit and just be still and not have something going on. Right? Learn how to do that in your prayer time. Learn how to work that in. How, how do we just, yeah, we talk to God, we pray, but then also learn how to sit and listen for his voice. And then have something, maybe a journal or something to write down. What God does speak to you. And I believe God speaks in so many different ways. I believe he'll give us thoughts. It may not be an audible thing. Sometimes people say they hear it at all. Sometimes it might be a thought. It might just be one word that you keep hearing over and over again in your, in your head. And, and you just write that down. Because we want to remember what God says, right? It might be, it might be a word. It might be a picture like that, that means something to you. It could be a number of different ways that God is trying to speak to you. Learn to recognize that. Write it down. How, how, what are you feeling? It, it might not be anything. You just might sense this incredible peace in that moment. There's so many different ways that God speaks. Learn to notice that. Write it down. Don't worry so much about saying the right thing or the wrong thing or even the length of time. The most important thing is that we do it. We have to. And the more you do it and learn how to do it, the deeper that time will be. Now, the how, if you need to know that, we, that, that might be for another time, and I'll be glad to, to walk you through that. But there, there's something about seeking after God. And there's something about kneeling. And I don't even believe it's the actual kneeling, but, but it's, it's the posture in which that means. It, it, it's a matter of just humbly, humbly, cum, humbly. It's a matter of humbly coming before God. Because I believe God is speaking. You don't have to kneel. You can stand. You can sit. You can lay down. But it's, it's the metaphor of kneeling and being humble for you. It's a posture. Just coming to God and saying, you know what? I, I don't know what to do in this moment. I don't know what to do in this life. I, I, I don't, God doesn't need you. And it could be life is going great, God, but I still need you. Right? Learning. I come before God. Just kneel before because we absolutely 
Absolutely needed. How, how, how did Daniel stand? He stood strong before men because he knelt before God. When life gives you more than you can stand, kneel. When you hear that word cancer, kneel. When you're struggling financially, kneel. When there's things going on in your family, kneel. When everything's going good, kneel. Humbly before God because we need Him. When things happen and you need to decide to take a stand for God, absolutely pray. You might take an amazing stand. You might need to decide, hey, my kids' uh, ball team is keeping us from being in church. We might need to go to a different place to play. <coughs> You, you might even decide, man, I really want this promotion, but this business deal, it seems a little lack. It lacks some integrity. I don't, I don't know if I need to go through it. You better pray about it. <coughs> Come on, young people. I, you know, my, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, they keep pressuring me to go further than when I know I should go. And, 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 and he's, you know, my boyfriend's pressuring me to have sex. My girlfriend's pressuring me to, to, to do this. You better pray. You better be prayed up. You better leave some room for the Holy Spirit in that backseat of that car. <laughs> but Pastor, what if, what, if, what if my kid doesn't play college? Bro, he's nine right now. Don't worry about college. <laughs> but Pastor, I, what, what if I don't get that promotion? God is our provider. But Pastor, what if, what if he doesn't want to be my boyfriend? Boy, bye. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Rejection might be protection for you. You want to have strength to stand? You want to take an amazing stand in your life? You better do it on our knees. And I can promise you this, because here's the thing. I can't guarantee you nothing bad is going to happen. I can't guarantee you you're not going to get the result that you want. Life's not a Hallmark movie. Sorry, dude. <laughs> Bro, th this ain't Disney that we're touring around. But what I can promise you is this. When you do what's right, you can always trust God with the results. This is a matter of trusting God. It, it, it's a matter of prayer, actually, but it's, it's a matter of trusting God with our life no matter what happens. No matter what we face in this world, no matter what the government tries to bring up against us, no matter what the world tries to bring up against us. It's a matter of trusting God through it all. Now, we know how this story ends. Come on, if you've been in church for a long time, you know that, that, that this story ends well for Daniel. That yes, he gets thrown in the lion's den, and no, the lions don't eat him. And yeah, I picture him just pet them. And, you know, it's like a big kid cat right there. That, you know, that's just where my brain goes, y'all. But we, we know how this story ends. But not every story ends that way, does it? Not all of our stories, not all of our struggles end that way. And Daniel, in this moment, doesn't know how it's going to end. Right? All Daniel knew is that for 80 years, God had been faithful to him. That for 80 years, Daniel chose to be faithful to God. And guess what? If he saves me, I will trust him. If he doesn't, I will trust him. And, and if you read through, we're going to skip this part. Here. We're about to skip up to verse 22. But, but if you read King Darius, he's devastated that he has to do this because he liked Daniel. They don't have found favor with him. King Darius trusted him. He was going to set him up over everything, but he made this decree and he had to stick to it. And he was devastated. He didn't eat. He didn't sleep. There was no partying all night in the king's castle. I knew him. He was devastated. And the first thing in the morning, King Darius wakes up and he goes in and he, and he hollers out, Daniel, are you there? Did God rescue you? And in verse 22 through 23, my God sent his angel. He shut the mouths of the lions. God didn't remove the lions. God didn't kill the lions. God didn't take them out. He just shut their mouth, right? And I believe, like, like we need to get a hold of that today. Come on, if we would just trust in God, if, if we will pray, if we will seek after Him, no matter what, He's going to shut the mouth of the voices that are all around us that are in your life, maybe in your own head. God will shut those mouths. He says, He shut the mouths of the lion. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in His sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Come on, can you trust in God today? The king calls the guys who falsely accused Daniel. Then he throws them in the pit. Issued a decree. 
that everyone in the kingdom should fear the God of Daniel. Man, did you get that? This wasn't just about rescuing Daniel, right? God is not just going to come through for you, but your victory will testify to his goodness. Your, your victory is going to show the world who God is. Come on, so, so when they throw out that word cancer, it's a, it's a big deal, don't get me wrong, but my God is bigger. When your marriage looks like it's over, come on, God is greater. When you lose your job, you don't know what to do, God will come through. When you're hurting, when you're confused, when you're not feeling it, come on, we can rise up because greater is he that is in me. Come on, we can stand. Come on, worship team, would you come up? We can stand no matter what we face in this life, but we trust in him. Years ago, a Monday night football game, you know, it's, it's football season, so I'm going to have to throw in some stories here. But uh, this was the back in the day with Walter Payton. Remember the great Walter Payton from the Chicago Bears? And, and they were talking on Monday night, and the announcers were talking about just how great Walter Payton is and, and all of his accomplishments, and that he had accumulated more than nine miles in career rushing yards, which is an incredible feat. But then one announcer kind of clashed back and like, yeah, and it was only like four and a half yards at a time. His greatness wasn't in just sprinting off, you know, like Anthony Richardson yesterday in the Florida USF game. Sorry, Michelle. But he took that 80 yard run. Come on, Trump. Where you at, Aaron? And, and, and he did that 80 yard run. His greatness, Walter well, Pickett's greatness, wasn't in these huge chunks of yardage. His greatness was in that after four and a half yards of tough yardage, he would get back up again, get back in the huddle, get the play. Get back out there, run another four and a half yards, and get back up again. Run the play. What am I trying to say here? When we face things, it's easy to give up. It's easy to give in. It's easy to say, you know, I'm just not feeling. I'm done. I'm tired. But in those moments, God allows us to stand ready to help us in our time. He is our help. The Bible tells us that He is our help in our time of need. He's always willing to forgive. He's always willing to come through. He's always willing to pick us back up. If you've been hit, if you've been hit hard, you may need a little time to catch your breath. Do it. Do it in prayer. Seek God. Allow Him to restore you. Allow Him to refresh you. Do it in prayer. Pressing on, even if it means taking just one small step. If you need to grieve the loss, absolutely do that. But do it in prayer. If you need the Lord to heal your heart, do it. But do it in prayer. Don't give up. Stand strong. Stand firm. Don't decide that it's not worth it because it absolutely is. Your life is worth it. Your family is worth it. This world is worth it. And each time you get up, you'll find that you're a little bit stronger than you were before. Each time you'll appreciate the grace of God as He carries you through situation after situation. You'll find yourself a little more resilient. You'll find yourself able to press on even more with courage. Kneeling to pray gives us strength to stand. Your ability to stand is determined, though, by your willingness to trust God no matter what. Life has a way of draining us sometimes. There's situations we go through. There's unfortunate things. There's things we didn't plan on going through. We got people that drain us, come on. The enemy will come against us, will drain us at times. And I want you to, I got this jug of water, picture that as your life, right? And, and there's things that will, will come against you and try to drain you. I haven't tried this yet, so I hope it works. It's going to come against you. It could be bills, it could be unfortunate things. One at a time, they drain us. Doctor's reports, let's flash them on up here. Spiritual attacks. All kinds of things that we could say and list out. Things in this life. And again, we're not promised that we're not going to face it. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But we are promised that a God that is amazing and good and loving and just and merciful will come into our life and help us pick up the pieces. Come on. And, and, and I love God because He mends our broken heart. I 
to love God because He comes in and He comes through for me time and time again. I've got no reason to doubt God because He has come in time and time again. And my God, He mends the broken places in my life. And I love God because I know I can count on Him because He's been faithful before and He'll be faithful again. He'll mend the broken places in my And not just mend this, not just uh, fix our brokenness, not just fill those empty places, but He fills me back up again, right? If life might drain me, it might empty me out, man, it does not matter. He, he fills me back up again. And I'm so thankful for that. Come on, if you're here today and you've been drained, life has been heavy, there's been things in your life that, that, that feels like it's something of life out of God wants to come into your situation, into your life right now, and He wants to fill you back up again. He wants to mend those broken places in your heart, in your soul, in your life. Come on, will you stand with me this morning? Come on, maybe that's you today. Maybe you came in today not knowing what to expect. But I came in expecting and believing God to restore somebody. I came in expecting and believing for God to come in and make someone new today. I came in expecting and believing that God would refresh us in this place. Come on, every eye closed. If you're here today, you don't know Jesus, and you're going through this, man. Life has just been drilling you over and over again. And you need Jesus to come in. You need him to mend your heart. You need him to mend your past, your life. All up over again. Come on. If that's you today, you say yes to Jesus. You've not accepted him into your life. And that's you. Would you just slip your hand up real quick? It's not to put on anybody on blast, but it's so that we can pray with you. Is there anybody here today? You don't know Jesus, you say yes to him. Come on, our prayer team, come on forward. We're going to pray for anybody that would like prayer today, no matter what it is. You may be sick, you may be hurting, you may be dealing with all sorts of things. For whatever it might be, we love to pray with you. But if you're here today and you would say, Pastor, you know what? I need to take a stand. I, I haven't been giving this my all. I've, I've been neglecting prayer. I haven't been trusting God. And maybe you're here today. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's not a matter of you not giving your life to Christ. Maybe life has just been tough and it's been draining you. You need to be filled up all again. I want you to come. Come to this altar. Come to this place where, where we believe God will meet you right here.